Yeah, my name is Robert Chambers. I'm a research associate at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex in the UK. Research associate means that you have retired and they have not yet discovered how to get rid of you. <laughs> Participatory development. development and GIS. Well, um, these have been two very important streams in development and they've come together. And the participatory stream has been going on for many years. And if you think of Kenya, uh, Harambe, um, around the time of independence, was a tr that movement was a tremendous part participatory movement. But now the two have come together. And um, I think it's the, the merging of the two is very positive in terms of its potentials. So in 1998, there was a meeting in the UK in Durham where a number of development practitioners got together to discuss the relationship between participatory development and GIS. You are amongst others and the group questioned whether the GIS and participation were compatible. With respect to that event, how do you think things have changed? At that time, yes. a number of us were very concerned indeed that GIS would be used to disempower people through the making of maps, because we know maps are so powerful. So at that workshop, which was just one day, we put forward a number of questions which we thought ought to be asked, which particularly were questions of who is empowered, who is disempowered, who gains and who loses. So how do you think things have changed since then? Is it the questions that you raised then? The questions still need to be asked. Yeah, but do they make a certain degree of contribution in as far as the compatibility? There, there have been some very important developments since then. I mean, we've seen in this conference and from how many countries there have been initiatives and people have been developing approaches. One of the most significant ones <coughs> is the development of 3D modeling, which Giacomo Rambali and others have been so much involved in, because that introduces um, the dimension, uh, the extra dimension and makes the mapping, or the model in this case, so much more visible, so much more easy to handle, so much more likely to stay in the community so that they own it, and so much easier for the facilitation of people expressing their own knowledge, their own spatial knowledge um, on the model. Much, much more powerful, I think, than um, <coughs> flat participatory GIS, although that is very strong as well. So while there have been um, a lot of positives in as far as that development is concerned, do you see any dangers in uh, the practices of PG PDGIs? I think there are a lot of dangers, <coughs> as there are in all participatory approaches, and we need to learn from the many things which have gone wrong with the spread of PRA, as well as good practice. Um, <coughs> one is the danger of taking people's time without any recompense. Another is raising their expectations. Um, another is endangering them or disempowering them through the information which is shared, which can then be used against them. Another one is generating conflicts within a group or community or between communities through participatory GIS. These are all um, things which need to, aspects which need to be looked at very carefully. So the commitment, the ethical commitments of those who facilitate participatory GIS are very important. So, relating to that, what are the important initiatives which could be used to support good practice? Those who fund participatory GIS need to understand it and not to require too much, too fast, on too big a scale. That applies particularly to the lenders and the donor um, agencies. They must understand that and not demand it on a huge scale. Another is understanding the importance of training and not trying to rush training. And this is training of people in the communities and also training of the facilitators who facilitate these processes. Um, and then I think the, the embedding, if you like, of a whole set of questions, which are the who gains and who loses questions. Whose model or whose map is it? Who keeps it? Whose legend is it on the map? Who is empowered and who is disempowered? These are the questions which need to be asked again and again and again. And if they are, and if those who facilitate and those who fund these activities 
keep on asking them and are aware of them, then I think we can look forward to a great deal of good practice in the future. But if not, not. And the dangers are very real. But up to this extent, do you see any um, hopes in the future and as far as the empowerment of the communities are concerned even in their participatory approaches? I think that there are great potentials for the future but it depends on the quality of the practice. Thank you. Do you have anything you'd want to elaborate on or add? The only <laughs> thing, the, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the only thing I, I would like to add is that I think that it is extremely important to bring together practitioners from different countries and we've got something like 45 or 46 different countries represented here and the exchange of uh, experiences between them is a very precious thing. What I fear is that there may be a great deal of non-participatory GIS going on which is disempowering local communities and that what we have represented here is a sort of scattered archipelago of good PGIS practice in a huge sea of disempowering GIS. I don't know whether that is the case or not but I'm fearful and so the spread of good PGIAS would seem to me to be a very high priority. So what advice would you give to the practitioners, especially the organizers of this workshop, of this conference? I think that they should concentrate on educating those who are in positions of power and who can support uh, the spread of PGIS. They should educate them in the need not to rush, in the need not to press for early results, in the need to concentrate on training of communities and of good facilitators, and to reflect all the time on the ethical issues which are involved. <laughs>